Carl, for coming here. Let's start just with the first question. Mm -hmm. So the concept of cultural diplomacy seems to be surrounded by a great deal of confusion. It is sometimes used interchangeably with soft power, public diplomacy and even propaganda. Yes. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on the differences in sure. the meaning between the concepts and the special characteristics of cultural diplomacy? Sure. Well, that, um, uh, I see cultural diplomacy as being a component of public diplomacy. So for me, uh, public diplomacy, which is the conduct of foreign policy through uh, engaging a foreign public rather than foreign diplomats, uh, for me, public diplomacy has five components. The first component is listening. The second component is advocacy, the, 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 the propaganda aspect, that is the, the uh, um, uh, selective presentation of your side of the story. Uh, the third element is cultural diplomacy, uh, conducting your foreign policy by some sort of cultural intervention in a foreign um, environment. Uh, my fourth element would be uh, exchange diplomacy, which overlaps with cultural diplomacy. Uh, and my fifth element is international broadcasting. But each of these elements is very different. And one of the reasons that they're different is they have different credibility. The credibility of, of uh, the listener comes from, well, do they actually respond to what they hear? The credibility of the advocate is, are they advocating according to their government's policy? Are they an honest advocate? Are they an accurate advocate? The credibility of cultural diplomacy comes from, well, does it have cultural integrity? Is it actually um, reflecting the, uh, the culture that it's supposed to reflect? Or is it somehow adrift? Is it being interfered with by politicians? So your cultural diplomacy has to be operated, I think, by cultural people, not by uh, politicians or bureaucrats or, 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 or somebody else. The credibility of exchange comes from, is it a mutual exchange? Is it two-way? Uh, is, is it a uh, free exchange? And the credibility of international broadcasting, well, that's based on journalistic ethics. Uh, is this broadcaster able to operate as a broadcaster? Or are they forced to become an advocate? So for me, propaganda is the, the sort of everything being forced into advocacy. And cultural diplomacy has been exploited for propaganda purposes, but um, th that's one, one of the problems, uh, and it's, cultural diplomacy needs, loses credibility. It doesn't really work if it is uh, combined with culture. Uh, sorry, if it's combined with propaganda in that way, Every, people can see through it very swiftly, as they saw through the cultural propaganda of the Soviet Union mm. during the Cold War. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, well, we wanted to ask you, as a, as a European uh, living, teaching, doing research right. in, uh, in the States, uh, have you um, <coughs> experienced any sort of uh, profound differences in the perception of cultural diplomacy uh, between the different sides of the Atlantic? Well, the exciting thing about the European approach to cultural diplomacy as it is now is that um, Europeans are much more ready to accept each other's differences. and. You know, in Europe, you can drive for a few miles and you're in a completely different culture, uh, albeit one that shares certain values with neighbors. Whereas in the United States, people live inside a hegemonic culture. So they may have a culture at home that comes from their, their uh, ethnicity or their national background, but um, they're much less exposed to cultures from other places in the world. So I see Europeans as more willing to uh, a, a, m more open to um, working with the commonalities of culture, uh, the shared values of different cultures than the Americans who have a sense that they've reached cultural perfection. And that's one of the things that irritates me about the United States is the sense that it's somehow culturally finished and doesn't need culture from other places. Uh, which I, th I believe is is wrong. I think that they absolutely everybody needs culture from other places. We're, we're never cosmopolitan enough. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I believe it does. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, uh, what role uh, do you see for the media to be involved in cultural diplomacy? And can you maybe tell us uh, a bit about the changing role of media in cultural diplomacy throughout the recent uh, years? Mm. By the media, do you mean the um, broadcast media? Um, well, I think that the media is a site of culture. That is, the media 
is a place where stories are told and they can open cultural exchange or they can close it down. And one of the most exciting developments in cultural diplomacy in Europe is the, the evolution of a joint television station, the Arte network, with, which is both French and German, uh, and a place where stories can be told together. And if you look at the way in which films are made in Europe now, they're almost all cultural, they're almost all co-productions. So we have a model right there in the cultural industry of, of people coming together, still telling a story that's integral to one particular place, but still it, it's a joint effort. So um, uh, uh, that's one way in which the media is becoming an agent of cultural diplomacy, maybe for economic reasons. Um, but So I see that as a, uh, as a uh, positive. Uh, Nils, yeah. your next question. Yes. Um, well, um, perhaps returning to a point you made earlier, um, an argument has been made by uh, Mark Gottfried uh, and others that um, the more sort of distance there is between an agent um, of a, a cultural diplomacy program and a poli political economic uh, agenda, um, the more likely the cultural diplomacy program is to succeed yes. uh, and I was wondering how do governments sort of strike that balance and okay. can it in fact be sort of counterproductive to have like a specialized cultural diplomacy section right. within a state department well, this is a this is an, uh, an old argument um, the I call it Lloyd's law because the the director of the British Council Lord Lloyd or the chairman of the British Council uh, Lord Lloyd in 1940 said very powerfully to the Minister of Information at that time in Britain effectiveness of cultural diplomacy diminishes in proportion to its proximity to propaganda. And so he was saying you have to keep your culture separate from your advocacy. And cultural diplomacy works best in countries where there is a separate cultural agency that can be culturally credible by being close to artists and insists on political distance from the foreign ministry. So hence you have the Goethe Institute model, the British Council, the Savances Institute, and the, the new French uh, cultural diplomacy agency is, is organized along these lines. The United States is unique among civilized countries for thinking that the best place to do cultural diplomacy is the foreign ministry. This is some kind of craziness, and it costs the United States, I think, uh, in terms of um, credibility. So uh, absolutely, I'm with Mark in that uh, I think that governments have to trust, which they don't do very well, but they have to trust their cultural agencies to do a good job and to uh, engage culturally. They cannot expect to have control of the message and to do the story, to tell the story themselves. Governments are the wrong people to be involved in cultural diplomacy. It has to be done at arm's length by cultural agencies to be effective. It has to be done ultimately by ordinary people, the most credible people or individuals rather than bureaucracies and governments. Okay. Yeah. Um, Actually, the Danish, in, the Danish example, the, the creation of the um, uh, Wisty found the uh, uh, creation of the Danish Cultural Institute in 1940 is an important example of, of this and the views of, uh, of uh, Wisty, the founder of that, that he's very much of the idea that uh, um, cultural agencies should be separate and should should be non-governmental or quasi-non-governmental organizations. So it's one of the Danish uh, contributions to the field. Okay. Yeah, I think. Just see, um, I don't know, Rebecca. Former um, Visti is the guy who came up with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can tell Mark. I will. I will. <laughs> it's former yeah, Visti. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do you have any questions relating to the uh, presentation? No. Um, I think I have one last question. Okay. Um, you discussed uh, different future trends um, yes. in cultural uh, diplomacy. And uh, you touched on the issue of evaluation, and uh, oh, yeah. you, you saw a future sort of obsession with the ev evaluation of cultural diplomacy programs. Um, and uh, one of your points was that cultural diplomacy programs might fall, it's very difficult to evaluate, so it might fall sort of prey to the mindset of politicians that need to see like quick returns. So this might be more pronounced in a democracy, perhaps. So since politicians need re-elections and stuff. Um, so I was wondering if we've seen China recently investing a lot in soft power and cultural diplomacy programs, uh, Confucius Institutes and stuff. Do you uh, see any uh, 
That's a good question. Um, uh, uh, sort of advantages of a non-democratic system like the Chinese in implementing cultural diplomacy well, programs. That's an interesting case because my take on the Chinese approach to cultural diplomacy is that it isn't really about engaging with international cultures. Uh, the underlying motive is to be seen to be um, engaging with the world by its own population. So I see Chinese cultural diplomacy as um, uh, f a profoundly uh, dominated by a desire for uh, uh, to, to serve domestic political ends. Now, let me explain. What the Chinese government needs to do, what the Chinese government is frightened about is its own people. It's frightened of the potential of the Chinese public to sow chaos. And one way of countering that chaotic tendency is to uh, e e e emphasize and underwrite the power of the party. And the party needs to show that it is doing good things for China. And one of the good things it's able to do is to restore China's cultural reputation in the world because Chinese people have a sense that they've, their reputation has been diminished, that they used to be a world leader, their name means the central land, and in recent centuries they've lost their preeminence. Now the Chinese government is now giving its own people the gift of the admiration of the world, saying, see how the world comes to the Beijing Olympics, see how the world comes to the Shanghai Expo, see how the world is learning Mandarin in the Confucian Institutes. And the rhetoric in the political speeches around the Confucius Institutes um, emphasizes numbers. Says, we now have 100,000 people learning Mandarin, uh, saying, uh, showing that, that the government, only the communist government, only the socialist government in China is capable of restoring the reputation of China before the world. That I, I see as the underlying um, agenda of Chinese cultural diplomacy. Whether it's working or not uh, at home, I don't know. I don't think that it has had uh, quite the results that the Chinese government would hope. Um, my sense of the Confucius Institutes is that where they've really succeeded is in rallying around international Chinese people uh, who might have been adrift in the past but are now feeling very attached to China and proud of China and are learning Chinese in the Confucius Institutes and that that's where you've seen the, the biggest contribution of Chinese cultural diplomacy as a, 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 a rallying point for, in, for the overseas Chinese. And that isn't what it set out to do in the first place, but it's still a, it's still a win for them. Um, but I think there's a need for more cultural diplomacy from everyone and smarter cultural diplomacy uh, in the future, uh, for, for, uh, more, more um, nuanced cultural diplomacy from uh, from the Chinese government, and you're right, they're able to do things without um, counting the cost. In fact, sometimes the cost can actually be uh, part of adding to the prestige of the project to say, see how much money we spend yeah, sure. to give you this. Yeah. This is uh, part of you know the pride in them. Having the most expensive Olympics is pride in the wealth of the country, okay. and so that can actually serve the interest. Yeah. Whereas it wouldn't wouldn't serve anybody's interest in the West to say, see how much money we're spending on impressing people around the world. It might have the res reverse effect. Yeah, yeah. So as for now, you don't consider it a successful sort of foreign I political think, initiative? I, yeah. I don't think it's... Uh, I think the jury is out, yeah. shall we say. Some of it's successful, some of it less successful. Um, uh, I, I think that the, the uh, there are problem, some problems with some Confucius Institutes, and sometimes, the, like, for example, they did a a subsidy of learning Chinese in classrooms in a city called uh, in California called Hacienda Heights, and it seemed like a, a easy thing to do. Just pay twenty thousand dollars and get some kids learning Chinese in the classroom. But the Taiwanese residents in the town claimed that it was Chinese propaganda, and so there were street protests and uh, riots at the board of education meeting, and uh, a lot of negative press that the Chinese government could have done without. Um, and so there are these mistakes and missteps yeah, yeah. along with the successes in the Confucius Institutes. Right. Uh, so it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag. All right. Yeah, I think uh, that was the last words.